we have some time to take questions uh, to Thomas and Gary. Josh Lipschitz, please. Yeah, they, um, I don't know if you guys can hear one another, but the question is about gender differences, and they're very interesting because of the um, sort of paradox when you look at ideation versus behavior, especially death. With ideation, females have more of it, typically, than males do, but they have far fewer deaths. Um, it's really striking. It flips completely around. In the United States, it's four to one for every one female who uh, dies by suicide, four men do. Um, and we think it has all, pretty much entirely to do with that fearlessness piece. Um, you know, you know this, this thing's genetic, and so females have it too, no question about it. But the part that's not genetic is about 35%. It's considerable, it's not, you know, the majority, but it's still a big chunk. And we think that has to do with experiences previously with pain, provocation, and the like. And nature, culture, whatever you want to say about it, is such that males just have a lot more of that on average than females do. And so we think that accounts largely for the gender differences. With regard to death, um, with regard to ideation, major depressive disorder accounts for a lot of that female suicidal ideation, um, we think. Our main focus has been on explaining death, and we think the fearlessness piece is a big piece of that. Sure. Um, I, I don't know, Golan, if you could put up that model again from my power, just to, just to have something to refer to. But, um, but I, I'm hopeful that you remember it, even if we can't display it. The question is about terrorism, suicide terrorism, and the relation of these ideas to that. And a lot rides on whether you, a lot rides on first assumptions. There is a big controversy in this field about whether it's true that suicide terrorism doesn't have much to do with mental illness. There's a book that persuaded me called The Myth of Martyrdom. Adam Lankford wrote it. It's an Oxford University Press book, 2013, I'm pretty sure, The Myth of Martyrdom. And in that book, he summarizes the research of an Israeli psychologist who may be here, whose name I'm blanking on, um, and Adam's own work showing that a lot of the terrorists who fully intended to die, they did every last thing, got on the bus, got to the cafe, all geared up. Explosive didn't detonate. Interview them and compare them to a match control group. You get a lot of depression and a lot of suicidal behavior in that group. So Adam thinks, and I agree with him, Adam Lankford is the guy who wrote this book, that that is suicide, that these people have one outlet for their suicidality and that's it. If that's true, then the model should apply. And if you think about 
what they do, do they train themselves to be fearless? Yeah, no question. Do they think that their deaths will be worth more than their lives? Perceived burdensomeness, absolutely. The, the controversy comes on the belongingness piece. And that's, that's where people are going to disagree. My view is that they do feel alienated. They do feel depressed. They do feel suicidal. They are vulnerable. And in fact, they're recruited because they're vulnerable. That's my view, but that's controversial. That's Adam's thesis in his book, which I, I highly recommend. Yeah, that's a great question. The question is that when people survive very serious suicide attempts, what's the future? What's the prognostic course for them? Um, for most of them, it's very positive, um, in part because they get scared off, because they know how, how daunting and fearsome it is, because they've been through it. They don't want to have anything to do with it again. Um, they also change their social dynamics via the suicide attempt and the aftermath sometimes in a positive way. Um, so for the vast majority of people, it's positive. And if you ask them in the hours and the day after the attempt, are you glad you survived? You get about 85% somewhere saying, in there saying yes. That group tends to have a pretty positive prognostic course, especially if good treatment floods in right at that point. There are no guarantees here. These are vulnerable people by definition. They've been suicidal before, so by definition, they're vulnerable going forward. It tends to be positive. And then it's that 10 to 15 percent who are very angry that they're still alive, wish they were st still wish they were dead. I mean, it's not rocket science to say that group has a poorer prognosis. And they just need a lot more intensive therapeutics than, than the first group. And the best known example, I think, of this phenomenon I was talking about is a guy named uh, Kevin Hines. And Kevin's got a book out. It's like I'm a book seller here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's called um, uh, Cracked But Not Broken. And it's about his experience. He jumped off the bridge, and he survived, and he exp explains it. And what he says these days is, I'm, I, still got, I still got bipolar disorder, and I got it pretty bad. I still do. It still produces suicidal thinking in me every day, but now I got something to live for. And so I'm, not, I'm never going to do that again. So you, you tend to get outcomes of that sort. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, he's probably not going to end up in that disastrous sort of situation again. I, I definitely hope not. Yeah, so I'll, I'll summarize. Well, you said you were going to ask why. Or tell me why you asked that. Yeah. Understood. I understand. Very interesting. Gary, you may have some thoughts about how to manage that clinically via ABFT, that, that scenario, but you've given me a chance to go back and, and clarify something that I really want to emphasize. And it has to, so the question was about plans, talking about the plans, and then acting on those plans. And I said 70% do that, which is true. But I want to face two other realities. There are a bunch of people who say that who don't die. 
and clinically they're vexing. They're difficult to manage. That's kind of what you're talking about partly. But here's the thing. We don't know who is who in advance. And so my recommendation is to take all of it seriously, especially in context of this other stuff, so that you fight every battle, you win all the winnable ones, and if you lose some of those battles, well, at least you fought them. And, and feeling that way is much better than, than feeling otherwise as a clinician. Um, so, that, now, so there's 30% who don't say a word. Let's talk about them for a second, because this is crucial. Are they not talking because they're not planning? Or are they planning very extensively and, not, and just not telling anybody? You know, because it could be either one. It's the latter. It's the latter. They're, they're planning for months, weeks, months, years sometimes, but they don't tell anybody. So the idea that that 30% represents impulsive suicides is something that I cannot exaggerate my skepticism about that concept. The idea that somebody on a whim, out of the blue, kills themselves, does something like that impulsively, I don't believe it. I just don't believe that. And, and by the way, there's no evidence for it except what people say to doctors and psychologists in the minutes and hours after a suicide attempt when the psychologist says, why'd you do that? Kid says, oh, I, I wasn't in my right mind, it just came to me. Because of the social demand characteristics of that situation, they don't take responsibility for it. Doesn't mean that's true what they said. So that's my view of impulsivity. There's a, a paper that summarizes that literature if you're skeptical about my skepticism, uh, Anestis et al., Journal of Abnormal Psychology, 2014, I think. We go into this in great, in great detail. I'm curious, though, about how you may, if you have any thoughts about the ABFT perspective one. It's not necessarily about ABFT per se. I'll just say one sentence because I don't want to take time. But I think that when a kid is uh, talking about committing suicide, there's a way to take it seriously without having to abdicate your role as a parent to set limits. Those things are not necessarily um, exclusive of each other. So it's a way to do that in a sensitive way without just abandoning all expectations.